Well, welcome everybody to episode two of my podcast, My Thoughts on This and Also on That. My name is Jeffrey Jocelyn. I am a husband, I'm a father, I'm a writer, producer, singer, songwriter, maker of things, and talker of ideas. Um, in this second episode, I'm going to expand a little further on uh, an instance that I alluded to in my first episode, um, which was an experience I had in 2017 where I had a um, manic episode just kind of out of nowhere, um, never really any indication that I um, had any sort of, you know, uh, you know, bipolar disorder or anything like that, which is, you know, what was alluded to after the fact. But um, I had this experience and found myself in this position, which I'm sure I'm not alone in this um, finding yourself in this position uh, at some point in life without warning. Um, you know, a lot, I, I'm, I would imagine there's a lot of people that, you know, find out early on that they're bipolar or, or some form of um, manic depressive or something like that. And I wasn't uh, one of those people. I went through my life pretty normal fashion, you know, accomplishing pretty much whatever I wanted to do. Um, you know, good life, good parents, good friends, um, faith-based, you know, these types of things that, um, you know, seem to be a recipe for success. And then, um, you know, 2017 comes along and I find myself um, kind of wide open and buzzing and, and some sort of feeling of connectedness to the universe or some sort of experience of oneness or, you know, there's a whole lot of ways that I could describe what was happening to me, but then very quickly um, being looked at um, kind of, you know, these sideways looks from my friends and family and ending up in a mental facility and medicated and all these kinds of things. Um, all, you know, just kind of out of nowhere. So um, what I'd like to do is dive a little deeper into that uh, experience in that story, um, which, um, interestingly enough, I have a recording of a podcast that I did. So let me set the scene for you a little bit. So before all this happened, um, as an artist, I was going by um, Jeff Jocelyn with one F, Jeff with one F. And I put out a bunch of records and I kind of, you know, it kind of came about through my brother's manager. He had taken some photos of me that he was sending around and he had written on them, Jeff with one F. I was like, oh, that's kind of interesting. So um, when I put out my first full length album or not my, I guess, yeah, I guess my first in 2012, which was called For Your Eyes Only, I kind of adopted the moniker of, uh, I think that's a word, moniker, <laughs> of, uh, Jeff with one F, Jocelyn. So I, I put out this record and put up website and all the stuff, social media, and even I had a podcast and all this stuff, like a brand. Put out two other records under that name, uh, a whole lot of stuff, and kind of came to a point in this experience where I felt like that particular side of me was a, some sort of representation of an old way of thinking or some sort of preconceived uh, or preconception about who I was or who I was supposed to be or all, there's all these things attached with it. So um, leading up to my experience, I was going by that name and through the process, I was um, thinking that I should, you know, it was kind of an experience of rebirth, uh, of a dying and, and rebirth. So I, um, I had this podcast that I started one of them was called DIYU and then there was another one called My Two Cents which was like a play on words um with regards to you know the the the, the monetary spelling sense C E N T S my two cents and also um uh sensibility so I called it my two cents S E N S E and in the process of this awakening or whatever this this episodic experience i started confronting these fears i started stepping into these places in which i felt like i was being held back by my own fears i started to press into them and each one um, would kind of open up 
uh, parts of me and I would kind of look back on the other side of those fears and be like, oh, well, that fear wasn't in a big deal at all. So then I just kept pushing forward, pushing forward. And I started talking about things openly that I was afraid to. A lot of times when you're, you know, a uh, person of faith, there's all this kind of like responsibility on you to like say the right thing and be a good influence and all this stuff. So I was kind of like kind of breaking through some of that. It's like in freedom. I had this podcast called My Two Cents. And I started just talking about um, things. I'm, I'm going to hopefully find this first podcast because it was during that time um i haven't been able to track it down but it was literally as i was going you know kind of ramping up into this experience and i was talking about some of my thoughts and putting them down um in in podcast form and then all of this went down um my hospitalization and all this kind of stuff and i came out and i um, and even before, right before I went in, when it was real heavy, I had, it was like I had deleted all my old stuff, my old name. I just like, I wanted to get rid of everything that was attached to that. Um, I even, you know, I cut, I was like I shaved my hair, I cut my own hair. Um, you know, there was a lot of stuff going on in my mind, this idea of rebirth. So I started this new thing that was called JSJ2, which is based off my name, which was Jeffrey Scott Jocelyn the second, my full name. Even had a different website. I even had all this stuff. So um, I guess I tell you that for two reasons. Number one, um, there's a whole world of music um, of mine under Jeff with one F, Jocelyn on Spotify. I had, you know, quite a bit of success with various um, things, a music video, and then a song called Sunshine that did has done really well uh, for me. And um, a whole world and sound even um, different sonically than what I'm doing now in a lot of ways. So that was there. And then I've kind of had to rebuild because of this experience <laughs> during that time where like that middle guy, the JSJ2, um, you know, didn't quite work out fully and i just went back to like jeffrey jocelyn just my own, <laughs> my own my own person or my own name um but you're probably wondering why i'm telling you all this what i'm about to play for you what you're about to hear is the podcast i recorded under that jeffrey jocelyn 2 or jsj2 or even i think i called it my three cents um oh yeah i didn't expand upon that so my two cents was like kind of me in that in that process of feeling like my prophetic sensibilities were being opened up and, and feeling like I, I was a channel. So I wanted to just kind of like, just let it come through me, whatever was, you know, the time I thought it was Holy Spirit and everybody else was afraid it was like <laughs> demons or something. I don't know, but I was open and I wanted to kind of, so the, the two cents was kind of this play on, um, this number one, this connection I've always had with the number two and um, signs and uh, symbols, uh, 222 and ways that I felt like that has been a part of my path. So it was like this kind of play on that, um, my two cents. And then I made this other one called my three cents, which is like, you know, and I guess biblical numerology, you have the number two, which is the number of the covenant. And you have number three, which is like the number of completeness. So I was kind of alluding to this idea of like, oh, I'm in a new phase now. But anyways, all this precursor to tell you about what you're about to listen to. So what you're about to hear is um, two weeks after my hospitalization. So it's the closest thing I have to like a fresh take on what happened to me. Um, I listened to it for the first time the other day. And there's, you know, definitely a lot of details left out, which I hope to um, put down in a book. Uh, because there's just a so, I mean, there's like endless, endless stories. You can't imagine the amount of what felt like eternity in that place that existed in a 72 hour period. But so many characters and so many experiences diving into my past and patients and people in there that represented people in my um, life and my story and all this. So, anyways, um, what you're about to hear is that. Uh, account from me in probably the closest and most, you know, um, proximity to what actually happened. So it's, it's more fresh than if I was to tell you now, you know, two years down the road, um, a couple observations about it, having listened to it, um, and, and knowing what I went through in the months following, you know, it, it kind of makes it sound as though, you know, man, I had all had it all figured out. I'm free. I'm not afraid of anything because of all this when 
you know, that could be further from the truth of what I experienced over the next few, you know, five to six months. I've definitely experienced a lot of rebirth, a lot of miraculous, you know, um, provision and providence of God and healing and restoring my life. Um, but, you know, I can hear a lot of like pride, I guess, in this guy thinking like, oh, he's just experienced this thing and he, he's got all the answer and he answers and he's ready to take on the world. And that couldn't be further from the truth because I experienced like such great depression and anxiety and paranoia and all this even months after. Um, so don't be fooled by that <laughs> when you hear this guy talk. Um, and the other thing, uh, you know, towards the end, um, yeah, there's just there's just things that I've changed my ideas about. So don't you know? This is just giving you a glimpse into um, that fresh, you know, kind of open wound, if you will. Me talking and 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 telling the story to set to set the scene as well. Um, I use this platform called Anchor to release the podcast back then, and I still do now. But what you can do on Anchor is you can actually um, release kind of little snippets. So you can just talk into your phone and that can be a podcast. So at the time I was walking around the neighborhood late at night <laughs> talking into my phone and, and there are little five minute snippets um, that they would cut you off and then you could start another one. So what you're going to hear is like 10 of those strung together. So in between each, I'm kind of like talking to people that might be joining the podcast five minutes in and the second a little snippet and saying, Oh, go back and listen at the beginning. So, uh, I just want to break these things down, but, um, yeah, I hope you enjoy this. I certainly did. I've found it really humorous lis listening to myself talk about certain things in my experiences and, um, you know, as horrific and as traumatic as it was, I think it's good to have a, a bit of a, you know, bit of grace and lightheartedness about it because of the fact that, you know, I think there is hope even in the midst of dark times. And that's always been my perspective, but this was probably the darkest time in my life. And, uh, it's interesting to hear <laughs> me tell the story in this particular space and maybe I'll expand upon it more. You know, obviously I'm writing uh, a book, um, but you know, maybe I'll tell some other stories from it because there's some really funny stuff that happened to me in there. Uh, also very horrifying, but you know, there's, there's, there's lots of great stories to be told. So that's the premise for what you're about to hear. Without further ado, here's me, Circa. Um, I think it's August, mid-August 2017, following a psychotic break, manic episode, and admittance into a uh, psychiatric facility and uh, the experiences that I had and followed that followed that experience. He's back. <laughs> um, folks, I can't even begin to tell you what I've been through since the last time I posted on here. I actually just went back through and listened to what I posted just to make sure I wasn't losing my mind because everybody else seemed to think so. And um, folks, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and, you know, I guess I got as much time as I need to tell this story, but... Um, <clears throat> You know, I talked, I think, in my last episode about Fishers of Men and how, you know, I thought I had died, like, for real. Like, um, like you know, I was talking more metaphorically. Um, but, dude, the rabbit hole was just getting started, folks. I recently spent um, three, um, three or more days in a mental institute, um, Del Amo Hospital, in the Del Sol unit. Um, because, um, I don't know, I was saying the stuff that I was saying on this podcast to everybody around me, and everybody around me, my family, friends, um, they thought I was crazy, and, um, they thought I needed help, and all the people at my, um, church that I was going to at the time told me that I had, um, now, you know, I'll tell you, for a while, um, I smoked a lot of weed, and um, I don't smoke any weed at the moment, and I don't really consume any other drugs or pharmaceuticals or anything like that. But um, I was for a while, and a few months, just like pretty heavily, just because I don't know, I like it, and it helped used to help me, but it also kind of sets me off. But um, you know, there was a there was a time when I was kind of weaning off of it, and um, 
and uh, some people thought that I had, you know, consumed some stuff that was laced with like, I don't know, PCP or meth or something, I don't know, I have no idea what, what they thought or what actually happened, but all I know is that it came to the point when people around me expressed that I needed help, and they were going to make damn sure that I got that help if it was the last thing they did, so I found myself being driven to a mental hospital against my wishes, and when I found that out, um, I ran for my life, and I cried out to Jesus to save me because I didn't know what was happening because everyone in the world was turning against me, and my, one of my best friends actually um, hung himself after coming out of a mental hospital where they, um, he was strapped down and tied up in a straight jacket and came out, um, was given all these medicines and prescription pills and he hung himself. Um, and he committed suicide just like his father did. And they're two of my favorite people of all time, two of my dearest friends and, um, still very good friends with his brothers. But, um, you know, in that moment I was scared for my life and scared that um, they were going to do that to me, and that my family and my friends had um, signed me up for that, and so I ran for my life. Now, I ended up on the porch of a man that was actually prophesied to me the day before by some women at a restaurant, and they told me about a man named Dave Scott with one T. Um, I don't know, I probably shouldn't say this dude's name on here, but anyways, they told me about a man who worked for the Redondo Beach, uh, either police department or fire department in the K-9 division. And I ended up on his porch, miraculously. And he was freaked out by me because I was scared and I was, you know, out of breath running for my life. And I sat down and I humbled myself and I said, please help me. And um, he gave me um, security and safety in that moment. The cops were called on me. Um, the cops came and picked me up. Me and the cops kind of broed down on the way to the hospital. They realized I wasn't a threat to myself or anyone else. And, uh, yeah, we got along great. They were talking about how people have a big misconception of them and how they're good people. They're here to serve and protect. But because of, like, the whole, you know, cop shooting, um, African-American people and the media spinning that certain ways, it, it's made people really afraid of them. And um, so I guess I'm running out of time, so I'm going to continue on the next one, all right? All right, here's part two. If you're just now catching this, go back to part one. Listen to that first. I'm going to continue my story. So anyways, I'm in the back of a cop car. First time in my life I've ever been in the back of a cop car. Kicking it with these cops, talking about what I do and where I've come from, and they're telling me about how, you know, they're good people, they're just misunderstood, and, you know, I'm like, you know, you guys are right. I don't know what it's like to have a gun pulled on me or have to, to, to chase down people with guns or potentially... Um, you know, that want to harm me. Anyways, we get to the hospital. They're like, dude, this guy's cool. No big deal. We're, we're, we're going to go. We don't need to write him up. They hand me off to the next three people who evaluate me psychologically. Um, at the end of the day, they say, hey, you're fine. No worries. Um, you're free to go. However, if you would like to stay, we have a place that you can relax, chill out, have some food, you know, spend a few days with yourself, whatever, you know, get some peace. I'm like, well, that sounds great because I'm not really digging on my family at the moment or anybody that's around me. So I would love to be by myself. Now, I did not know what I was about to go into. But what they, the way they sold it to me sounded like a resort or like at least just a place with, you know, a place to chill. Like, I don't know a place where I could maintain my freedom. <laughs> Folks, when I tell you that that is not true, I'm about to tell you what that is and is what it looks like. I walk into um, the hospital. They take, um, you know, the, my belongings. They take my, you know, anything that could, be, that could potentially harm myself with or whatever. And then I go in and I have a doctor take me into a room with a padded freaking walls, people, and he sits across the table from me and he goes, I don't believe in God. I'm a scientist. I'm going to evaluate you based on that. And everybody, and, and, and then he proceeds to tell me that someone else in my life who will shall remain nameless, who's not my wife, who's not um, a part of my life in that way, is putting me in this building, is the reason that I'm there. 
and then he begins to evaluate me and ask me if I'm hearing voices or if I'm afraid of the devil or if I think I'm a prophet or if I think, you know, any of these things. Now, in this moment, I got really scared, really scared, because here's this man who calls himself a doctor telling me he's going to evaluate me and, and give me some kind of terminology to put my put me in a box to like categorize me and then prescribe me some stuff like I got really afraid so I said all right now let me ask you a question sir I'm in here voluntarily correct he said yes I said okay what are my options for voluntarily leaving he said well you can leave but it's against medical recommendation now he had me in a, in a interesting position because I knew that if I went back out into the world with my people, my family, my friends, all the ones who thought I belonged in there, they were going to think that I'm still crazy because I left against medical recommendation. So I said, all right, that's fine. I just knew I had to get out of there. So he goes and he um, sits in his little cubicle, glass cubicle that the, the, the nurses and the doctors all hang out in while the patients walk around and you can't hear anything that they're doing but you can see them and if you knock on the glass they maybe pay attention to you and sometimes they don't and it makes you feel like you're going absolutely insane just like every other part of that place anyways they I walked in to the other section to try to get their attention because I saw them dialing numbers on a phone and I'm going, oh great, they're calling my family, they're, I don't know what they're doing, but I know I can't stay here right now. So the doctor, when he sees me wave my hand to try and get his attention, he comes at me like a raging bull and he says, you better sit down right now, I'm going to put you on a 14 day hold. Now if you don't know what that means, that means you're in that place stuck enslaved for 14 days and you can't get out now that was the last thing I wanted so I said okay sir and I sat down I'm running out of time on to part three okay so part three and as I said in part two if you're just now tuning in go back to part one that's the beginning of the story anyways at this point I am sitting in a chair in a cafeteria with a man telling me to sit down shut up or he's gonna put me on a 14 day hold in a mental institute. Now, I agreed, because that's not what I wanted. So I said, okay. He begins to continue to get my things together, or so he says, um, to, to release me against medical recommendation, which, man, I wish I had jumped at that chance, but it's all right. It all works out for good. It's going to be a great story. <laughs> Anyways, so then I... Um, he goes, well, we're going to let you leave, but first I got to make sure you don't have any weapons on you or anything that you could hurt yourself with. Now, they already knew that I didn't because remember before when I said they took my possessions? So they knew, this dude knew I didn't have anything. He then takes me into a bathroom, a very small bathroom, with just me and him, shuts the door. It's the most claustrophobic situation I've ever been in, and asks me to strip down naked and spin a 360. Yeah, that's right. So then we get out, and they're still doing their thing. And at this point, I can't, I don't even know who to call because, you know, we have these phones and everybody's numbers, even my wife's number. I didn't even know my wife's number because it's just in my phone. We've got new numbers so many times that, like, it's just in my phone. Well, guess what? I didn't have my phone, and I didn't know how to call my wife. I knew how to call my mom. Um, but it's a long distance number, so any long distance numbers you have to, they have to dial and transfer it to the phone. So in that moment, I was feeling very unsafe and wondering if they were even, you know, gonna transfer that. Like I didn't know; I'd never been in this place before. All I knew was I was very afraid and very anxious and very scared. So what did I do while I was waiting? I actually talked to one of the nurses, and I'm like, bro, I was trying to be real secretive. <laughs> I'm like, bro, you gotta get me out of here. And he pointed to the doctor and said, that's the boss. He's like, you want to get out of here? You play by his rules. And I was like, man, you got to be joking right now. So guess what I did? I started to mingle with the patients. <laughs> I started to mingle with the people. I started to sing with the people. I started to sing gospel music with the people. I started to sing Don't Stop Believing with this chick who had the lyrics on a piece of paper. And uh, 
and uh yeah and another dude started beatboxing to our to our groove and i was making music with my mouth while she was singing and i was talking to the patients about jesus and i was talking to the patients and laughing with the patients and sharing with the patients and pretty soon i was like you know what maybe this is why i'm here so let's hang let's hang for a minute okay i can do this i can do this i can do this hey if all i gotta do is hang with these cats these people who that the world has deemed crazy or um, you know uh, harmful to themselves or others or military vets there was a guy who was a military vet in there or you name it you know just throw all the labels in a hat and shake it around you know the crazy ones the outcasts the losers right so I'm in the air with the with all the labels but I'm, I'm feeling safe with these people these are good people kind people they're looking at me going <laughs> multiple people are like are you john mayer I'm like no but i like that dude a lot like are you sure you're not john mayer I'm like no i'm jeff <laughs> my name's jeff um but anyways i'm vibing with these people i'm loving on these people they're loving on me so i'm like cool man let's have some let's have some food together let's hang together let's make some music together let's talk well this is where it gets interesting so that's why I stayed. I actually went and talked to the doctor. He he tried to come talk to me in another claustrophobic room, and I'm like, bro, can we please like go outside? Like, is there anywhere else we can go? So he took me outside. I was able to breathe for a moment, and uh, in the little courtyard that they have like their free time, and I felt safe. I finally felt safe, and like, okay, fine. I'm gonna stick this out three days in here I'll be good I'll be home everybody will be satisfied the people on the outside will think you know I went into uh, you know the cuckoo's nest <laughs> like Jack Nicholson and uh, came out and uh, everything will be good so uh, on to part four all right so this is part four and again if you're just now tuning in head back to part one everything will make a lot more sense <laughs> so anyways I decide I'm gonna stay I'm feeling safe the doctor is actually seems much more kind much more open um, probably because he know he's got my buddy in this place and he's got some plans for me uh, I didn't realize this at the moment but you'll hear what followed so anyways I don't remember exactly what happened that day for the rest of the day but I know that that night they um they're like hey why don't you take some of this? I probably met with a doctor. I think I met with a doctor who talked to me and he's like, I'm going to put you on this medicine, a medicine called Seroquel, going to help you sleep. I'm also going to put you on this other medicine called Ativan. That's going to help with your anxiety. And then I'm going to put you on this other one called Restoril. And I don't know what he said that was for, but there's three medica medications. So later that night, they're like, okay, everybody, medicine. Come get your medicine. I take the Seroquel. It's supposed to help me sleep. It knocks me out now i think i woke up like halfway through the night and was having trouble like I, so here's the thing everybody was worried about me because i was having trouble sleeping um i was sleeping like maybe three hours a night i changed my diet to a vegan diet i'm not that way anymore but you know i still think it's probably really a good like good thing for some people but everybody was worried about me because of a few things no you know I'm not sleeping, I'm calling myself a prophet or whatever, I'm talking about different things, I'm feeling like, you know, I'm, I can hear in the spirit or I can communicate or I don't know, I, I mean I can get into it later, but these are things that people were worried about with me. So in the joint, they're like, well, here's some medicine that'll help you sleep. I'm like, alright, cool, sounds good, I'd love to sleep, I used to sleep all the time, now for some reason I'm going you know pretty fast my mind's moving and I'm having trouble sleeping but fine let's take some Seroquel so I take some Seroquel it knocks me out halfway through the night I get up hey would love some more of that if you could just help me go back to sleep so they, they, they give me two other things I didn't realize it was the other two medicines I just took it because I'm kinda out of it I'm on some whatever now the next day now let me say this about that place there are there are windows but they're not open and down the hallway they're like these really trippy paintings of windows and like so you walk down the halls all you're allowed to do is like walk down the hall sit in the common area where they have the TV playing 24 7 or the cafeteria um, and then you get like 15 to 15 minute breaks a day outside where they're playing mainstream radio 
or whatever radio anyone wants to turn it to. But um, these are your options. So it's either walk down the trippy hallway. Um, there's no clocks except for in the main um, room um, where the doctors are inside the little, I call it like the fishbowl because you're like looking through the glass. It's at people who could care less about you maybe. Like the nurses and stuff, they're pretty cool. Like they're fairly helpful and were helpful to me in certain instances. But some of them are not. Some of them are mean. Some of them not kind at all. Um, anyways, the next day I wake up and things are just a little different. Um, the patients are talking to me and I'm talking to them, but um, it's like everything has shifted. It's like the news is like all about me. Every commercial is like all about me. Um, it's like some kind of a weird thing that's going on. The patients all of a sudden like know a lot about me, like in such a way that like I'm feeling like I'm talking to, mm, I don't know, spirits or like hearing um, the voice of God through people. Um, it, um, I was actually convinced to the point because all I, all I had to do in there all day was hang out with the patients. And these folks are open, man. Like these folks are wide open to it all. So the stuff they're saying to you is coming from all directions, all dimensions. So I'm, I'm listening, I'm engaged, I'm interacting with these people and I'm running out of time again. So on to part five. Part five. Again, if you're just now tuning in, go back to part one. Um, so I'm listening to the patients, I'm talking to the patients now. Um, I'm starting to get the sense that uh, all of these people have something to tell me, teach me. And I'm there, so I'm there to learn. And I'm, I'm getting a lot of stuff, you know, like I'm getting, I'm getting hit by just a lot of stuff, man. I'm like going back into my own past and saying, oh, you know what, this is some stuff I did I shouldn't have done. Let me hit up my wife and let me confess some things to her. Let me get some closets, some skeletons out the closet. Let me confess some sins. Let me get rid of some secrets and let's clear that up. And I did, and that was beautiful, and there was, been some, there was some healing there. Now, what followed that day besides just everything? And when, man, when I tell you, like in the Bible it says, uh, to God, a day is like a thousand years or something like that. In this place, a day, uh, uh, an hour is like a thousand years. Um, now... Like like time just it just goes away. It feels like forever. You don't know what time it is, and it doesn't even matter because like you're on their schedule, so it doesn't even matter. You're in there. You might as well just like participate and go to the group therapies and go to the the activities and go eat and you know. Um, anyways, um, I'm talking to the patients, and at some point. I don't know what happened, I mean I can tell you in greater detail, maybe at some other point, but through the various interactions I was having and the things that these people were saying that were like, they knew, it was like they knew things about me and my life and were able to convince me of things because I was wide open because I was on these drugs, man, and I didn't know, realize what I was on, but um, at the end of my stay there, I got the information sheets about the medicines and besides just all three of them having a, a side effect list that's a mile long, two of them, one of the side effects, the Ativan, I think, one of the side effects is hallucinations. One of the other side effects of one of the other drugs is suicidal thoughts, people. Come on, are you hearing me right now? So I'm on three medications, and I'm hallucinating, and I'm being convinced by the patients that I have killed myself, that I am dead, and I don't remember it, and honestly, I'm having trouble remembering a lot in there. I don't know why, but in that moment, I was convinced that I had killed myself, that I had choked on a sandwich or something in a shower or something. I don't even know. But in that moment, I was like, I'm dead. I'm in purgatory. And actually, I'm on the second level of hell. And it goes to level seven. And I cannot go any lower than this because this is pure and utter hell nightmare. And I am just, I mean, you can imagine the level of anxiety. Now, however, there was a speck of hope. <laughs> there was a few cats in there that were like, yo, stick with me. We're going to get you out of here. It's like, okay, sounds good. I don't have anybody else I can count on, so I'm going to go with you. Now, these guys, they were like, you got to get to Anaheim. 
If you can get to Anaheim, that's where you need to be. There's going to be a big concert in September. A big concert. I'm like, okay, sounds good. As far as I know, that's where the angels play, right? The angels are in Anaheim, so I'm going, that must be heaven. These people are trying to get me to heaven. I got to get to Anaheim. This one dude loaned me five bucks for the cab ride. This other dude was going to give me $80 to take him there. And then one dude told me I had to bring two or three other people with me. I mean, I was losing my mind, people. So, my mission was to get out of there. Now, what I didn't realize that it, it was that if I had listened to certain voices in there and tried to get out, they would have locked me up, tied me down, taken me to another level. More isolation. Um, now, luckily, <laughs> I found some sanity. I picked up the phone, I called my wife, I called my brother. Now, even though I was kind of convinced that somehow I could still call out from purgatory, I was like, okay, maybe I'm okay, maybe I'm alive. But I kind of went back and forth between, I'm not really sure. Um, so anyways, on to part six. Okay, part six. Again, if you're just not tuning in, head back to part one and enjoy the ride, folks. So, I'm on three medications. I'm losing my mind. I'm hallucinating. I'm thinking I am dead in purgatory, trying to stay out of hell and get to heaven with a few specks of hope thanks to the phone lines <laughs> and my beautiful wife who was there with me through the whole thing on the other side of the phone line. Now, I, I'm bouncing back and forth between maybe I'm alive, maybe I'm dead, also completely hallucinating. The TV is like reading my mail. It's like everything I'm watching on there is... I mean, I can't even describe to you. It was like this. I don't know if you've ever done any psychedelic drugs. I don't necessarily recommend them. I'm not like an advocator for stuff. I'm just an advocator for thinking for yourself. But if you will ever try like mushrooms or um, psilocybin, I guess that is mushrooms, but I meant to say LSD. These types of things, you know, there's the possibility of a bad trip. Now these things take you completely outside yourself, out into the outer realms of the universe, out in the outer realms of your mind, other dimensions, like they're intense, intense, intense. Now what can happen in those is you, sometimes you think you're dead, people have talked about meeting God, people have talked about meeting aliens, like all kinds of stuff. So what was happening to me in there was I was having a bad trip and I was in the mental institute. I was literally having a, like my worst nightmare in real life and I'm bouncing back and forth between am I dead? Am I alive? Am I in purgatory? Am I okay? Meanwhile, all the patients in there are like, I felt like I was surrounded by either de uh, angels or demons and any patient could be any one of those at any time and I was trying to figure out who to listen to who was telling me the right information now what I quickly realized was there's a game you gotta play in that place in order to get out and that game is sit down shut up participate in the group therapy sessions take your medicine tell them how great the medicine is working how great you're sleeping and how wonderful you're doing and then they'll let you out eat the food participate take the medicine play along now recently I my friend has told me that um, you know that's called chess <laughs> and they actually had me in check I thought they had me in checkmate but they had me in check and I had to figure out how to play along in order to get out and I did because I'm out now but and it's been two weeks since that happened and, and plenty has happened since then but it just went on and on and on and on and it got deeper and darker and then more beautiful and darker it was just like I mean, one day, I didn't take the medicine because I'm like, dude, I felt weird after that, and I'm like, I wanted to kind of prove a point, you know, so the next day, after not taking the medicine, now, then one night, um, actually what happened was I fell asleep on my own, and they tried to give me the medicine, and I found out that you could actually reject the medicine, and I was like, well, I'm not going to take that crap, because I'm, I'm sleeping fine on my own. Now, what happened was, I, I was asleep for like two hours. And then uh, I, they were like, tried to give me the medicine. I'm like, no. Uh, and then I tried to sleep on my own for the rest of the night. And people kept coming in the room all night, turning on the light every, like, I don't know, so many hours or so. I'd managed to get some earplugs, so that kind of helped. But ultimately, I slept on my own, but it was a, still a rough night of sleep. And the next day, in all the therapy sessions, I'm, like, telling everybody, like, how great I feel. See, all the other patients are, like, 
you know, the medicine's making me anxious, I'm feeling stressed, I'm feeling, I don't like this place, I need to get home, I need to get out, all this kind of stuff. Some people aren't even sure how they got there. My roommate himself doesn't even know how to talk, like hardly, He's just this nice, sweet guy, but, you know, could barely understand him, sometimes better than others, but, you know, there's people in there that, have, I don't even know how long they've been in there, they don't even know how long they've been in there, and they don't even know how to get out. So... One thing I discovered that night is there's this thing called the Patients' Right Advocacy Group. And there's a number you can call in there that if you are held against your will for 72 hours or more, you can actually call this line and they'll get you a lawyer um, and they'll pay for it um, to help get you out of there to, to defend your human rights. Um, so this is some of the things that I was discovering that night. On to part seven. All right, so this is part seven. Again, if you're just now tuning in, head back to part one. Hop on and enjoy the ride. Now, I'm discovering this patient's right advocacy group. I'm actually uh, sharing um, and, and helping. Like Everybody has that sheet in their file, I guess. And I'm helping some of the other guys to realize that they have that sheet and, and, and helping them realize that they can make that call. But then, you know, I'm telling everybody, like, like, all the other patients are, like, filled with anxiety, stress, worry, and I'm like, I feel great. I slept last night, didn't take any medications. Um, I'm feeling good. I'm eating. I'm fine. You know, all this kind of stuff. So all the medical records show, like, the day that I didn't take my medicine, I'm like, right as rain, and everybody else is, like, hating their life. So uh, I think it was that day that that same doctor threatened, who threatened to put me on a 14-day hole was going to take me to another section of the hospital like he as he described it a more isolated section and i'm like no sir i'm not going to that place so i think this is at, at, at this point is when i started to try and reach out to the patient's advocacy group because I, I was beginning to get a little afraid because i felt trapped and didn't know what was going to happen to me um now i probably had to to do it, go through like nine or ten transfers to finally to finally tr find somebody and then they even said they couldn't help me until after 72 hours so i had to at least stay there for 72 hours before they could even have somebody help me or like create a court case on my behalf so i was stuck there so i had to figure out how to make the best of it so again i realized that i had to take that medicine i had to do what they said to participate so that's what I was gonna do so the last night I was there now they had some other stuff too that was cool the, the one of the two of the things that saved my life in there besides well there's a few things there's this thing called the Gideons I know you've probably heard of them they put Bibles in hotels and hospitals and mental facilities I had a Bible and I read that Bible all day and I went to the verses that I that I've been reading my whole life and they came to life for me and I sang and spoke the name of Jesus and he came to my rescue 100 percent he came he gave me peace he gave me shelter from the storm he gave me sanity in the midst of insanity and if it wasn't for that Bible and it wasn't for the truth that I know that's tattooed on my arm Isaiah 41 10 fear not for I am with you I, I, I would have lost my mind in there, people, and people lose their mind in there, and they pump them through a full of pharmaceuticals, and they lose their mind f f further, because the side effects are hallucinations and suicide, like, come on. Now, I, I participated, and I'm reading my Bible, <laughs> trying to hang on for dear life, and I'm crying, because I feel like I'm being taunted by demons, like these women in there. We're like nothing against women, but these these particular women were like over lunchtime one time. We're like, it, it was like this. It was like everybody in there, the patients knew all about me, and somehow they were able to like talk about my sins without them knowing me. Like it was crazy. Like they were just like, and then they were laughing at me, making fun of me, and and like it was just like absolute utter torment. Like mental anguish and torment. I felt like I was literally being tormented by God. I thought I was being tormented by God because I'd done something wrong. Um, which, you know, I, I guess everybody can relate to that, at least feeling that way or wondering if that's the case. Um, um, but I realized that, you know, that wasn't the case. And, and honestly, I don't know what happened or why, but I know that I definitely dealt with all of my 
shit in there, all of my sins, all of my frailties, all of that. I came to terms with it and I said, I'm sorry for it all, <laughs> but I need you, Jesus, to save me because I don't know how to get out of this place. And I, the last night I was there, I decided to take the medicine, right? I was convinced that I was going to take this medicine um, that actually I wasn't supposed to take that the nurses were actually giving me some stuff that the doctor didn't prescribe and I'll finish that on part eight <laughs> all right part eight I'm gonna try and finish it up with this one if you're just now tuning in head back to part one so here I am my last night there I am convinced that the medicine they're about to give me is going to kill me because it's the wrong stuff and I'm gonna die and that what's going to happen because of any the number of things that I, you know, chatted about with my fellow inmates, if you will, um, had me convinced that there was an army outside, an army of musicians, of my family and friends, that was rallying around me at this point. That I was like some kind of a martyr for the system, against the system, and that I was going to die at the hands of doctors prescribing me um, the wrong medicine. And that, um, but they were going to come to my rescue and there was going to be a massive court case around me and around this situation and the whole thing, the whole system is going to fall down. So, I, <laughs> I get all the information about the medicines. I read through them. I didn't read them through them very good because I didn't recognize any of the side effects on the sheet. I just, I was just kind of looking at them and thinking like, well, here we go, it's time to go. Now I held up my little cup with my medicine in there, I looked around at the nurses and I cheers them, <laughs> and I took them, and then I just sat and I read my Bible from like, I probably read from Psalms to like, uh, Psalms 30 to like Psalms 40, out loud, confidently. And people, I was at peace. I was completely and utterly at peace. I was ready to go home and see Jesus and be with Jesus and be with God and be with my grandfather and great-grandfather and everybody that's come before me. I was at peace, people. I was ready to die. I was willing. But guess what? Oh, well, first of all, I, they made me go back to my room and I shook like my body was like shaking from the medicine. I could barely walk. Somehow I ended up in the shower like thinking, I don't even know. I was in the shower, sitting in the shower not with the water running but just sitting in there and like one of the nurses had to come get me out of there and put me in bed and I woke up the next day and I was alive I was alive I was still hallucinating <laughs> um, um, but I was alive and a couple of things that saved my life in there were the um, that day they had karaoke and I sang my ass off like I've never sang because you know I'm a musician I'm a singer I love music and I came to life it was the most joyful I had ever been in that place. It was probably the most joyful I'd ever been in my life. Because I thought I was dead. And then I was alive. And I got to sing. Now, that same day, I went from being completely up to completely way down again. Because of the patience and because of my hallucinations. But then, they, um, we had art class. And we had painting. And I, I painted a picture. I never painted before, honestly. I, I'm an artist, so I can kind of do whatever I believe in my heart, and I know that that's the case. So if I want to paint, I can paint. Um, so I picked up some paints, and I painted um, Palos Verdes, or like the, 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 the bottom half of what's called the South Bay of Los Angeles, this beautiful place that I first came when I moved out here, Redondo Beach, and this beautiful coastline, and this beautiful... Um, ocean view and um, with this beautiful sign I painted this sunset and then me this little guy <laughs> surfing a wave and I, I, I painted my paradise because I knew that um, I had to get out I had to get out of there and I had to get back there to my, my peace my paradise my family my wife my daughter who I never knew if I was gonna see again um, but I thought I died and then I was alive and um, that day I got out and folks I am free. I thought I was free before, but let me tell you people, I am mother beeping free. Because you know why? Because I died. I thought I was dead twice. But I wasn't, and I, and, and I went all the way to my fear. It's like Jim Morrison said, once you, once you confront all your fears, there's nothing left. So I went all the way to the point of death, and I found Jesus there waiting on me to take me home peacefully so guess what people 
I'm not afraid anymore. <laughs> I'm not afraid of anything anymore. I'm completely and utterly free. On to part nine. Welcome to part nine. Parts one through eight are my tales through a mental facility. Part nine begins a new day, a new journey, a new new chance at life. Um, so, when I got out, they tried to prescribe me the same medicines. I took the Seroquel the first night I got out because, you know, people around me were insistent that I take it. You know, it's supposed to help me sleep or whatever, so I'm like, fine, whatever. I took it and I uh, had trouble going to sleep because in my mind I was hallucinating. Um, I was shaky. Um, and then the next day I was like cotton mouth like crazy and felt really weird. And I'm like, I'm never taking this again. Get away from me, people. I promise you I will not take this medicine, whatever you do, nor will I take any of the other medicines. And, uh, yeah, I haven't taken it since, and I've been able to sleep, and I, I still have some anxiety here and there because I think I really went through, like, a pretty serious trauma in there. Like, because when I tell you that I went through hell, when I tell you that, play, that hell is real, and it's a place called a mental facility, and you, you take your pick, like, I, I mean, no, don't get me wrong. I don't, I'm not one to bat. I don't want to bash Western medicine. I don't want to bash anything because we're all just doing the best we can, and maybe that helps people. Maybe it does. And honestly, I'll say this about it: for me, it was the best and worst thing that has ever happened to me. It was literally a nightmare, literally a personal, an utter like hell, hellish torment nightmare. But it also completely set me free. I came face to face with all of my demons, all of my sins, and I asked for forgiveness, and I repented, and I asked Jesus to save me from that place, and he did. And now I have a story to tell. I now understand the gospel better than I've ever understood it in my life, because Jesus is real. It ain't no fairy tale. It ain't no... No, like, I mean, whether or not, like, I'm not, I'm not here to argue, like, the literalness of the story, but what I'm going to say is that it, he, the spirit, the Christ, consciousness, whatever, is real, and he will come to your rescue if you say his name, <laughs> 100%, and I experienced that, and I was given a rebirth, I was given a new name, so this is actually going to be my last um, episode on here whenever I finish the story and then I'll, I'll refer to you, I'll refer you to my new name which is just my old name which is Jeffrey Scott Jocelyn the second I picked this JEF thing up along the way from other people and I kind of adapted a role I guess of this JEF guy kind of hiding under a beard and long hair and, and a whole other conversation but it's a new day it's a new thing happening um, and, and what I've had to learn in the process is not so much different than it was before. You know, like everybody thought I was crazy, but I still feel the same way now. I still feel I have a gift and a, and a, and a voice and a message to the people. I just now know I have to be a little more discerning about who I tell. <laughs> because if you're not careful, they, they'll crucify you. Um, you know, before I went in, I was really connected with Jesus and wanting to be Jesus and going around saying, I am Jesus, but you are too, and we're the body of Christ. And what I realized is that if you want to be Jesus, you want to be the body of Christ, you want to connect with Jesus, you better be willing to lay down your life. You better be willing to be crucified. You better be willing to be put in a mental facility for the cause. But guess what, people? I signed up a long time ago because you know what? Your freedom matters that much to me. You people matter that much to me because everyone deserves to be free. Everyone deserves to feel love. Everyone des deserves to, to experience the life that they want. Everyone deserves to live the dream that they want. Everyone deserves to be free. And that's, what I, that's the truth. That's why I do what I do. That's why I sing my song. That's why I'm up. At, I, don't really, I don't know why I'm up right now. I'm just awake and I don't really care anymore because if I'm awake, I'm awake. Like I'm not really going to try to resist it. I'll sleep when I'm dead or whenever I need to sleep. But I've been walking around the neighborhood talking to you, whoever's listening, to let you know that it's real. Jesus is real. Um, and all you have to do is say his name and he'll come to your rescue and he'll set you free. But be careful because <laughs> it might cost you your life. It might cost you everything, but that's okay because uh, death has no sting. That's the point. Death is just a shadow. On to part 10. So, part 10. Again, if you're just now tuning in, head back to part one. Come along on the ride with us. So, I'm on the, I'm on the flip side. I'm free. My job is to, to try and set you free. I know I can't set you free, but Jesus can. 
and he set me free and uh everybody's got to go on their own journey and i gotta you know what i learned is i gotta stop trying to fix people you know i was trying to fix people i was uh you know calling myself a prophet or whatever which i don't even know what that means or what like I, I, i'm not interested in labels i'm just a i'm just a voice i'm just a vessel i'm just a mouthpiece for the divine and i think we all are that if we allow ourselves to be so i write songs i create podcasts i create art to set people free to remind people that they're loved to remind people that they're sons and daughters of god despite whatever church or whatever religious institution or whatever governmental organization tries to tell you differently I'm going to continue to tell you the truth, just like Martin Luther King did, just like John Lennon did, just like um, JFK did before they got shot. <laughs> um, and I'm not trying to necessarily put myself in a category where I don't belong or exalt myself, because that's not what I'm interested in doing. I'm just interested in playing my part. I'm just one of many. I'm just one of the body. I'm just a, you know, I'm just, I'm just a, like I said before, a fingertip or a mouthpiece or a, you know, like a cuticle. <laughs> you know, like I'm just a part. I'm just playing my part, and my part is to communicate my story, and to share what I'm learning, and to create art, and to create a world that's better than the one that came before, and to create change, and to create good, and to be um, participating in the good, and speaking out against the not so good, like we're having right now in Charlottesville, Virginia, these white, white supremacists trying to exalt themselves above other races, and creating violence, and creating chaos. <laughs> and a president who's not doing anything about it, and a president who's not saying anything about it, who's supposed to make America great again. You don't let, you don't let white supremacists run rampant. At least, at least you don't, you don't do, you don't stay silent, you know? You don't stay silent, and that's what I'm doing. I'm not staying silent because I can't. I can't stay silent, you know? I'm not afraid anymore. I'm not afraid to die, um, you know? I, that's just what it is. And, and it's a beautiful thing because, you know, many months ago I was too afraid to rock the boat or too afraid of what people think, and I don't give a shit anymore. I just don't. And it's a beautiful place to be. It's a freeing place to be. Um, and however you got to get there is however you got to get there. But once you get there, man, you are unstoppable. And people are going to look at you like you're crazy. They might even try and put you in a mental institute. But hey, just holler, holler at Jesus and he'll get you through. So anyways... Um, follow along with me now to a new place. <laughs> you can follow along with me at Jeffrey Scott Jocelyn the second. I think it's J S J two is my name, but Jeffrey J E F F R E Y Scott Jocelyn I I is how you'll find me from now on. And uh, yeah, we'll continue to grow together. We'll make some music together. I made a song recently for the Susan G Komen Foundation, the cancer um, foundation, the more than pink movement. It's a song called Stronger, which coincidentally. I don't believe in coincidences, but was released on the day that I was released from that place. And the lyrics go, You are stronger than you've ever been. You are standing on the shoulders of your family and your friends, and you can stare that fear right in the eye and tell him that his time has come to an end because you're stronger than you've ever been. And that's true, people, whatever situation you're in, whether it be cancer or locked up in a mental institute or stuck in a church that keeps telling you you're a bad person, and that God only loves you if you jump through these hoops, like wherever you are, like just know you're stronger than you've ever been because you've got at least one friend in me who's telling you the truth that says, Jesus is, is here for you, I'm here for you, your brothers and sisters in, in the universe, in, in Christ, in the body of Christ, the sons and daughters of God, the ones who are awake to who they are with you. So don't be afraid, don't be afraid. Don't feel alone. I felt really alone through a lot of this, but now I don't because I'm learning who my people are and who I can trust and who I can share things with. And my wife and I have grown a lot cro closer through this, although it's been, you know, very, very difficult. But my wife and I have grown closer, and um, I'm stronger than I've ever been. So thank you for listening to this story. Follow along with me at the other spot, JSJ2. Talk to you later. Peace.